I recently bought one of these. It's an ESP32 dev board. ESP32 is pretty cool. It's the um, successor to the ESP8266. 32-bit microcontroller, super cheap, and the key feature is it has built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. I had a fun thought experiment in mind for this. Could you run a whole pinball machine off of this? Because of course, you know, I'm always thinking about pinball machine controller boards. I thought it'd be cool to try to drive Neo pixels with it. Uh, if you don't know what these are, basically it's RGB LED, one bit in, one bit out. So it's minimal wiring to hook these up and they cascade to one another. I wonder if there's a library. I've set up the ESP32 environment on Arduino. Let's see if there's any examples. Uh, ESP32. Oh, RMT right NeoPixel. So the RMT is a uh, remote control driver, like an infrared remote control, like your television would have. And yeah, you can basically program pulse whiffs intended for infrared communication. But in this case, you can use it to drive NeoPixels. So NeoPixels have a rising edge at 800 kilohertz. And then the width of the pulse determines if it's a zero or a one. So a short pulse is zero, long pulse is a one. All right, so let's say this library works. I tested it out, but what's all this? No, wait, for every bit? Look at this, for bit equals zero, bit is less than eight. So for every bit, it's doing this. So every bit has four um, uh, variables. Level zero, duration zero, level one, duration one. Oh, okay, yeah. So it's like, is this high or low? That's the level. Length, 400 nanoseconds. And then the off period, level zero, time 850 nanoseconds. Four variables per bit? Uh, the entire library is on GitHub. Let's see, ESP32. ESP HAL, Hardware Abstraction Layer, RMTCH file. Okay, let's see what's in that structure. Okay, here we go. Structure, duration, zero, level zero, duration one, level one. <gasps> you int 32? Four bytes times four for every bit? There's also a value in here. This example code is driving 32 NeoPixels. All right, and that consumes 16,464 bytes. All right, let's write that down. Now let's change that. Let's add 32 more NeoPixels and see what the difference is with the RAM usage. 19,536, 19,536 minus 16,464. It's a delta of 3,072 divided by the 32 LEDs that we added, that's 96 bytes per NeoPixel. Oh, so, so if we had 64 NeoPixels like a pinball machine would have, ah, 6,144 bytes? Uh, th that's more than it took to go to the moon! Why can't we use a standard SPY bus? SPY, Serial Peripheral Interface. It's pretty simple. There's effectively three lines, clock, data out, data in. Every time the clock is pulsed, one bit of data is sent to or taken from the peripheral. So Adafruit has an article about this and they're using DMA, direct memory access. I mean, that's cool because you can basically set up the DMA and say, hey, dump all of this RAM over the SPI bus and it will work automatically. Um, what they're doing here though, is they're packing the bits to take a look at this, see how they're using basically three times the number of bits in the spy bus. So they're using the bits of the spy bus, running it at three times the data rate, and then using the bits to create waveforms. See how they have long pulses and short pulses? They got that long there, short there. I guess that would work, but that's still gonna take three times the memory. Okay, so I propose a solution using minimal external circuitry to solve this problem, so you can just use a standard plain Jane vanilla spy bus to drive NeoPixels. Uh, let's see. Ah, there we go. 74HC123, dual retriggerable, monostable, multivibrator with reset. 
So this device has two timers in it, and we need two different pulse lengths for our NeoPixels. All right, so we have uh, falling edge input, rising edge input. That's the one we'll use. We have two pins that set the pulse time using a capacitor and a resistor. Then we have an inverted output and a non-inverted output. And then down here, basically everything is just duplicated, rotated, you know, 180 degrees. Okay, here we go. Time in nanoseconds equals K constant times resistor times capacitor. Hey, here's another data sheet. This one's from TI. The part's actually Nexperia, but whatever. Ah, here we go. This is the formula that will work for us. I have some 100 picofarad capacitors, so we'll use that as a constant. And the two variables will be the time required and the resulting resistor needed. 350 divided by, uh, let's see, 1.5 constant times 100 picofarads. 2.33, all right. Jot that down. Then the other one would be 700 nanoseconds divided by 1.5 uh, times 100, 4.6. All right. So we need 2.3 and 4.6 K ohm resistors. I think what I'll just do is use a couple of 10 K pots. That way we can dial it in because this formula might not be exactly right in the real world anyway. We're in Eagle. Let's go into part. Search for one, two, three, wildcard. Ah, there we go. Retriggable monostable multivibrator. I'm gonna plunk down two of these because there's two of them in the package. So th there's everything that we saw in the data sheet. So let's go over here. Bring these uh, positive outputs over there. So we wanna use B because it's the rising edge. So we're gonna connect the Bs together. It won't appear connected on the schematic because I want to leave some space for the resistor and capacitor. Okay, so the clock signal will be going into both of the B inputs, basically tie A to ground, because we don't want to leave that floating because that could cause a false trigger. All right, those are both ground. Clear, uh, we don't want to clear the timer, so clear is active low, so we're gonna tie that high. Okay, this document tells us how to hook up the capacitor and the resistor. We put the capacitor across the two pins, then we attach the resistor to the R pin, and then have the other side of it go to VCC. All right, let's add the capacitors and the potentiometer. I just need the symbol. Great, I'll take it. Okay. Patow. Patow. We're going to tie one end of the resistor to VCC. All right, so take the R pin and attach that to the wiper of the pot. This schematic is not going to win any beauty awards. Okay, and then we just put that capacitor across those two pins. Okay, this is enough to get started. We have our two timers in one integrated circuit. Then we have our capacitors across the two programming pins. The other side of the pin goes to two potentiometers, which are both tied to VCC. So we can use these potentiometers to adjust the time. All right, let's get this built. I wired up the components from the schematic onto this piece of prototyping board. So we have the 74123 dual timer here, our two 100 picofarad capacitors, our two 10K trim pots. Then we have five volt rail there. That's going to hook up to my bench power supply. This is from the AFG, the Arbitrary Frequency Generator, on the oscilloscope. We'll use this to generate an 800 kilohertz pulse to simulate that of the SPI bus. Probe 1 is going to be hooked up to the AFG, so the scope will be sensing itself, basically. So probe number 2, we're going to hook that up to this timer output. We'll call that bit 0. And channel 3 will be the other timer, which we'll use for the one pulse. Okay, I'm gonna power my bench power supply. All right, circuit's active. I'm gonna activate the AFG, arbitrary function generator. 
Okay, so this is what we're seeing. The top line, the yellow line, that is the AFG pulse being generated by the oscilloscope. So see, we can come into here and we can set the frequency and the voltage level. So I have it at 800 kilohertz, which is the frequency that we need for the NeoPixel. So that's the rising clock frequency, specifically between this pulse and that pulse, right? Now here we have the zero channel and the one channel outputs. The potentiometers are both centered so they're the same length. So this is, this is the cool part. Simply by adjusting the potentiometer, we can dial these in to what we want. See? Okay, so for the short pulse, the zero pulse, we want 350 nanoseconds. So let's just line this up. We're at 100 nanoseconds per division, so let's just adjust this until it's 3.5 divisions. 1, 2, 3.5, 350. And for the one pulse, we want that to basically be twice as long, 700. Let's just offset it here, we'll be able to see it. All right, so we're gonna go this way. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There we go. To summarize, our timer is being driven by the rising edge of this clock signal. And in this case, it's simulating a spy clock signal. And then based off that rising edge trigger, two separate waveforms are created with different lengths. A short one for zero, and a longer one for one. All right, so now that we have our waveforms, how do we choose which one of them, the short one or the long one, gets sent to the NeoPixel? For that, we're going to use logic gates. I'll just grab any old and here. And then we also need an or. Let's call this one, we'll call that the zero. And this one will be a one. So zero is a short pulse. So no matter what, we're going to at least see a zero with pulse. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tie one side of the zero into this OR gate. Now the one, in order for the one to be active, we need to actually see a data bit from the SPY bus. All right, so we're going to create a new line, which also goes into the AND gate. This is going to be, I'll call it SPY data. So no matter what, you're going to have a zero pulse, right? That goes into the OR gate. So the OR is like, if this OR this is one, I'll output a one. Now, if there's also a high bit on the spy data along the clock pulse, this line will be one, and that will go into this AND gate. So it will be ANDed with long pulse to actually output a long pulse here. And this is going to feed into the OR gate. And then the output of the OR gate will be your NeoPixel data. Basically, we have two timers. They are each creating their own different pulse width, and they're triggered by the same clock, which is our spy clock. Those two pulse widths are sent out to an OR gate and an AND gate. So no matter what, you're gonna see the short pulse width for zero. But if the spy data is also valid, if there's a one there, that gets ANDed with a longer one pulse and ORed into this output, giving us our NeoPixel output. All right, I've added an AND gate and an OR gate, and I've attached them to the outputs of the zero and one bits. So I'm gonna get this hooked up to the scope and we'll test it out. Okay, I've got the AFG hooked up again. And then I also have a scope probe on that so I can look at the input clock frequency. And then this pin is the NeoPixel output. I've got that hooked up to channel two. And then finally, this is the uh, SPY data input. I'm just gonna hook a wire up to that and I can manually make it zero or one. Okay, there's our 800 kilohertz pulse. Let's turn on the circuit. All right, so channel two is our NeoPixel output. See how it's not stable? That's because the line is open. So I'm gonna attach the serial data line to zero. There you go, now we just have the short pulse. And if I attach it to one, we'll get the long pulse. Nice. Okay, so we have two different pulse widths that match what we need for the NeoPixels. We now have the ability, using logic gates, to choose which one of those pulse widths is output. This thing is ready to drive NeoPixels. Let's hook it up. And here we have the clock and Mosey master out slave in hooked up to the ESP32. So first we'll just see if we can get a spy signal from this, make sure that's working and then hook it up to our board. All right, I've got this hooked up to the probes on the scope. 
just gonna power it up with USB. Let's do 250, let's do three bytes because we're gonna do that for our LED anyway. Let's do 255, zero, and then a stripe. Cool. Uh, spy clock, it's one megahertz. We're gonna change this to 800,000 hertz or 800 kilohertz because that's the frequency we need. Let's send it to the board. This board, I have to tap this button to program it. Somewhat inconvenient, but oh well, first world issues. So when it says connecting, I release the button and it does its thing. Great. All right, looks like we've got something over here. Let's take a look at it. Zoom in. Let's uh, stop that right there. All right, so channel two is the clock. So you can see there's eight clocks every time. And then channel one is the data. So the 255 appears as all ones, zero is all lows, and then the AA striped pattern. Cool. Let's uh, zoom in on this a little bit more. Now, if you notice, it sets up the bit first and then does the clock pulse. So we're gonna wanna change the mode so it does the clock pulse and the bit at the same time to work best with our circuit. Now, what we're doing right now is we have a mode zero set, so it's doing a uh, clock pulse while the bit is set, but we want this mode where it does the clock pulse and the bit pretty much at the same time. So we're gonna go back over to our code and change the mode to one. Right, so see how the clock pulse and the data line, if it equals one, are going high at the same time? That will work better for our circuit because our pulse logic is going to occur right about here, so we want to make sure the data line is definitely high when we put it through that AND gate. So now this should actually send data to a NeoPixel. Let's hook up this NeoPixel ring from Adafruit. So clock signal goes in here. The data line goes here. And I still want to see our input clock. So I'm going to just add another jumper here so we can look at that with the scope. That way we can compare what's going on. Let's plug the Neo pixels into the output and there you go! One light is on because we're only sending three bytes. So the top channel, that's the clocks coming off of the spy bus. And then the bottom one is our Neo pixel output. So if you notice, we have some long pulses down there. Then on the second byte, since it's all zeros, we should have some short pulses. There's a bit of a slope. We could probably improve that with a capacitor, but this should still work. And then our striped data, you know, the AA and hex alternates. And you can definitely see the long and short pulses. So it's one, zero, one, zero, blah, 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 blah. All right. And the NeoPixels reset when they are held low for a certain amount of time. I think it's like six microseconds. So even though this isn't the most efficient way of transferring spy data since we're just doing it in a loop, it will still be fast enough. I modified the code a little bit more. Uh, we're going to begin the transaction and then basically do a light fade. So 16 lights with different brightnesses. So what's really cool is you can do something called a DMA, direct memory access. You can say, hey, spy bus peripheral. I want you to start at this point in memory, RGB index zero, and then dump 192 bytes onto the spy bus. And the peripheral will do it for you automatically. The CPU just has to tell it to start. And that is the really great thing about this is it will take a ton of overhead away from the processor and just use the spy peripheral to do all the work. So, you know, this takes, uh, what, probably like two milliseconds to dump 64 LEDs worth of data. That's actually quite a long time for your program to sit there doing a loop. So now with DMA, it'll do it automatically. So there you have it. Using three 74 series logic chips, we made a SPY bus to NeoPixel adapter.